and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. I have two guests for today's program. The first guest will be Morgan Barnhart, co-founder of the Zombie Response Team. You heard me right. Morgan will tell us why she and many other people are seriously prepping for a zombie apocalypse. Later in the program, Irish investigative author Anthony Summers will talk about his latest research regarding the JFK assassination. First, the global news headlines. The CIA is secretly collecting bulk records of international money transfers in and out of the United States. The surveillance of Americans' financial transactions was reported by the New York Times. Officials told the Times that the collection of financial records was authorized by the Patriot Act. Money transfers in and out of the USA through services such as Western Union, MoneyGram, and PayPal are among the transactions being secretly collected and stored by the Central Intelligence Agency. CIA spokesman Dean Boyd declined to confirm or deny whether... The bulk data collection program exists, but he said the spy agency conducts lawful intelligence collection aimed at foreign activities. A spokesperson for Western Union would not answer the New York Times questions about whether the company had been ordered by the U.S. government to turn over its wire transaction records. Internet search engine giant Google said... The U.S. is gobbling up more user data this year. Demands for user data jumped 37 percent in the first half of 2013. Nearly 11,000 official requests from government agencies for information about what people are searching for on Google. Google, Apple, Facebook and other technology companies want the U.S. Congress to restrain the NSA in order to counter bad PR. The companies say makes consumers think that they are freely cooperating with the U.S. spy agencies. NSA Director General Keith Alexander told the Baltimore chapter of the CFR that Edward Snowden leaked up to 200,000 classified documents to reporters around the world. General Alexander said the docs will continue to be leaked and that they are being released in a way to inflict maximum damage to the NSA. Interestingly, the general said, quote, and it's hurting our industry, unquote. Your industry, general. What industry? The spy on Americans industry? I I didn't know you saw it as an industry. Of course, that reminds me, one of the documents released by Edward Snowden revealed that the NSA refers to the White House and other government agencies as its customers. So, I guess it is an industry. I'll tell you one industry that wishes all the Snowden news would go away. U.S. technology companies, that's who. Did you notice what happened yesterday in Wall Street with Cisco stock? Cisco's shares plunged 11% yesterday. Reuters reported that the stock price fall was spurred by news that Cisco's revenue could drop 10% this quarter and continue following falling through the first half of 2014 due to to a backlash by customers in other countries concerned about revelations that the NSA is spying on the world. In addition to Cisco, IBM and Microsoft could catch a backdraft from the NSA scandal. Jim Lewis, senior fellow with the Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, told Reuters that all the big IT companies are concerned about the Edward Snowden fallout. I'm going to float a really far-out conspiracy theory Uh, This is a possibility. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just floating the idea. 
What if, and I'm, I'm underlining, what if Edward Snowden works for Mr. Obama? I know that sounds really far out, and I say a lot of far out things, but that's, that's really far out. But in this age, nothing is beyond the pale of possibilities, and you have to consider everything. Why should we at least consider the possibility that Mr. Snowden is an agent for Mr. Obama? I'm not saying that he is. I'm just saying it's an idea that has crossed my mind. Here's why. Barry Satoro is a human wrecking ball. He's a bull running inside the China shop. He's deliberately destroying everything in his path. Mr. Obama's assignment is to do as much damage as possible to the United States within an eight-year reign of terror. He's not the president. He's a well-paid, bumbling buffoon. He's a trained actor, told to behave like a president. But in reality, he's a political hitman, an agent provocateur. Just name one part of this country that is better off today than before he took office. He breaks everything he touches. He defiles everything. It's not an accident. It's his assignment. Let's look at the mess he's created in the Middle East for the USA. Egypt's defense minister, General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, greeted a delegation of high-level Russian officials with open arms and warm words of friendship. There were signs of a major alliance shift in the Middle East after the talks concluded with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and Defense Chief Sergei Shergu. General Sisi called the two-day meeting a historic start of a new era of military cooperation between Egypt and Russia. Now, of course, the U.S. relations with Egypt were seriously damaged when Barack Obama supported the Muslim Brotherhood takeover of that country. Raymond Ibrahim was here yesterday, and uh, he talked about the criminal charges that a, that an Egyptian law professor and a team of lawyers filed in the International Criminal Court against Barack Obama and his half-brother Malik Obama. Malik is the bagman for a Muslim Brotherhood outfit based in Sudan. And we all know about the death and destruction the Muslims have inflicted on the Christians of Sudan. Malik Obama holds the purse strings of a Muslim Brotherhood jihadist group in Sudan. And just think about what I just said to you. The half-brother of the U.S. president is an Islamic jihadist. And the mainstream news media doesn't think that's a big story. Now listen, before I take a break, this is something I want to put out to you to think about. Right now, there is a trial underway in Cairo of Morsi, the Morsi the Muslim Brotherhood president. There is a strong possibility stuff may come out in this trial that implicates Barack Hussein Obama. We'll just watch and see. Got to take a break. I'll be back in a minute with my first guest. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Listen to the Bible from Romans 8. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. From Romans 8. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Hear more at RadioBible.org. That's RadioBible.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. One year ago this month, the U.S. Army conducted a drill in which the scenario was a zombie apocalypse. No, it, it wasn't a Halloween costume party on a military base. It was a very serious exercise 
that cost a lot of tax dollars. It was organized and conducted by Halo Corporation. It was played out at Halo's Counterterrorism Summit, a uh, security conference that among its participants uh, was former CIA director Michael Hayden. Uh, the scenario included uh, 1,000 U.S. military personnel and a uh, host of uh, state and federal officials. A company executive told the Associated Press at that time, quote, no doubt when a zombie apocalypse occurs, it's going to be a federal incident, end of quote. What is this fascination with zombies? And why are local, state, and federal emergency management agencies prepping for a zombie apocalypse? Well, let's ask one of the leaders of the zombie response team. Morgan Barnhart is on the telephone. The group's website is zombiereponseteam.net. Morgan, welcome to True News. Hi, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here. Listen, I'm totally ignorant about this whole zombie apocalypse uh, mania. I've been watching it for several years, what's happening, but I'm baffled by it. What, what is the fascination with zombies? Well, you know, I mean, zombies have always been very popular in culture for, I mean, Romero really made zombies super popular, you know, way back when. (laughs) And uh, ever since then, they've kind of been steady popularity, you know, but it seems like recently, in the past couple of years, it's kind of exploded and really kind of stayed steady in its popularity. You know, shows like The Walking Dead and such can definitely have an impact on the success rate of zombies. However, um, you know, I mean, zombies are are one of those things, they're so much different than werewolves or vampires or whatever, because they're just these undead creatures that will just keep going and going and going, no matter, like, if they've lost you know, limbs or, you know, eyeballs or their jaws or whatever. They just keep going and going and going, and it, they just don't stop. Mm-hmm. Morgan, into, uh, what, you know, what was, what's the origin of, of zombies? Where does this all come from? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different... Um, I mean, there's, there's kind of a couple different origins, Um I mean, mainly the the zombies started with um, the zombies coming up from the graves, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where dead people suddenly came back to life. It wasn't. It was never an infection or anything like that. It was just you know a horror story. It was just you know these undead creatures coming back from life or coming back from the dead, and um, you know it evolved from that. So I mean, is, is it connected? Honestly, is it connected to Haiti? The, the whole Haiti? story, the, the story, did it originate in Haiti? Um, I, I think there is an, an origination from there, but I mean, there's, I mean, it kind of originated from a few different places, I believe. Mm-hmm. I was wondering um, if there was a connection to Haitian voodoo, if that was the origin of the, of the story. Um, I can't quote that. Okay, all right. <laughs> do, you, do, you think, do you think that uh, zombies, is this a myth or is it reality? Well, in reality, I think there might be a certain type of zombie, you know, maybe like um, a, maybe like a, a, um, a deformed version of rabies, something like that, mm-hmm. which could make somebody just kind of go crazy and, you know, just kind of do whatever, you know, mm-hmm. outside of just eating, but just go mad. Mm-hmm. And um, rabies is very contagious, so... Yeah. That, but that could be a real life thing, but it would have to be mutated to be transmitted and to be reactive very quickly in order to have any sort of apocalyptic effect. Okay, last year or so, things got really weird when we had the outbreak of real zombie like behavior. And it started with, you know, the guy in Florida down in Miami mm-hmm. that ate the face of. Of a homeless man. He didn't just bite him. He ate off his face. Yeah. And then after well, that, it started spreading. And people were, I mean, you, you were seeing these reports of this, of these cannibalistic attacks on, on humans and all this talk about zombies. I mean, what in the world got this started? 
Honestly, I am pretty sure the media is taking the word zombie and kind of using any chaotic event or anything that's just kind of crazy or mad and putting zombie in front of it. Whether, you know, it is the signs of zombies or not, the media is really taking hold of the word zombie because it is a hot, hot keyword right now. Mm-hmm. And they will do anything they can to use it. So in those cases, it's, um, it's you know, that guy was literally lost in the head. I mean, people do that. I mean, those cases happen actually on a more regular basis than we might think. I've never heard of it ever in my lifetime. Well, when people get really drugged up, that's, I mean, they go crazy. You know, people react in many different ways. And that guy, I guess he was on like, what, bath salts or something. Mm -hmm. And it just, it reacted to his brain mm-hmm. differently than okay. you know. Well, tell me, else. Why, why do you think so many young people want to dress up as zombies? Well, I mean, what is this? I, what is this? It's to me a morbid fascination with with death. I mean, I see these videos and I see pictures of young people dressed as zombies. What is the attraction? Um. I I don't know. I guess you'd have to ask the people that do it. Um, they all <laughs> well, you're the zombie response team person. I'm, you know why? Why? You know why? Why are people doing this stuff? Well, we're the survivors. We're not the zombies. I so know. We. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, people people just have a you know. I mean, it's just like with vampires or or any of the other horror centric um, creatures. They want to be those creatures because they're so popular and they're so horrific. I mean, the horror scene is huge and people love all the ghoulish and blood and, you know, people love these things and they love to be um, disgusting and that's Mm -hmm. one of the best ways to do it. I mean, eating brains is a great... Is this is this just a is this just a, a fad that's going to go away and be replaced by something else next year? Well, you know, as I was saying, um, zombies have stayed pretty steady in popularity for decades upon decades. But um, I think we're, co- I think we might be reaching our plateau here shortly. People are kind of, you know, people love The Walking Dead and and those kinds of things. But um, it's getting, I, I think it's going to start you know, uh, faltering out here probably in the next couple of years. But mm-hmm. zombies will always remain popular no matter what, whether it's super popular or just, you know, a little underground mm-hmm. popularity. Uh, okay. The, this military drill that was held last year, uh, I mean, CIA director was involved in it. Um, a thousand troops. Uh, why would the U.S. government spend – substantial sum of money in a military drill that involved people dressing up as zombies? Um, probably for the same reason that FEMA brought out a comic book about zombies and, you know, the, surviving the zombie apocalypse, because zombies are very popular right now, and everybody's trying to get that attention. Mm-hmm. So the military running these drills with zombies in it, it's getting people's attention, and it's yeah. But it's getting I, their I, attention I, for what reason, Morgan? I mean, we're not going. I mean, it's not like the Pentagon is expecting an invasion of zombies, are they? I don't think they're expecting an invasion of zombies, but I mean, you know, they they're you know trying to prepare for anything, you know, just like we are in the sense of. I mean, anything can happen. You know, a serious pandemic could happen. It may Mm -hmm. not be, you know, zombies or whatever. You know, bird flu could suddenly take off and, you know, start killing millions of people. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So, you know. All right. I'm I'm going to put out an idea. You tell me if if you've thought about this, that perhaps they are expecting a biological attack that is so hideous, a, a, a biological weapon that is so incomprehensible to the human mind that the victims will be so horrifying and so disgusting that the only way that they can prepare the public for such a scenario is to, is to put the name zombie on it and, and, and try to get the public 
mentally prepared for a biological attack. Have you th- thought about that scenario? Well, I think that's giving the government a little too much credit, personally. But, um, you know, it's not to say that they haven't seen or heard of those types of things. I mean, there was this guy, you know, trying to play with the, um, I think it was the, what virus was it? It was a, it was a virus that um, is no longer, um, you know, around anymore. Mm-hmm. And he was playing with it, and then he wanted to... He was playing with it to see how he could make it into a biological weapon. And then he wanted to release these results out into the public. But the public stopped him and said, you know, don't do this because then somebody's going to get a hold of this research and actually go forward with it. But the thing is, I'm sure the government has seen and heard of lots of different scenarios in which a biological uh, warfare could happen or something could happen. Mm-hmm. And it's good to get people's attention, whether it's through zombies or whatever. And that, that certainly got people's attention, didn't it? Yeah, it did. All right, so tell me, what is the zombie response team? Um, we're an organization that basically is helping the individual prepare for disasters. Um, or emergencies, or something even as drastic as a zombie apocalypse or any apocalyptic scenario. Right, now, um, come on, Morgan. When you say we're we're helping people get ready for disasters, even a zombie apocalypse, there you go. You're you're saying that there. Are you saying that you really think there could be a zombie apocalypse? We believe that anything is possible, even a zombie apocalypse. I mean, the thing is, for real. Have, I mean, you know, I, and I'm not. I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm honestly trying to. F- find out what you guys really believe we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow so we plan for the absolute worst scenario which is a zombie apocalypse do we believe it's going to happen anytime soon probably not do we believe it's actually possible uh anything's possible so So, what what is a zombie apocalypse what give me a picture what would it look like I mean, it's it's kind of. Have you seen the movie Cages? Yes. That would probably be the closest thing to a zombie apocalypse, where people have just gotten infected. The disease is spreading very quickly. People are dying. People are, you know, um, not 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 necessarily a, you know, eating of the faces of the flesh or whatever. But um, you know, it's just a. Okay. A disease that is spreading very quickly. And and you just, you just, you just uh, confirmed uh, my my scenario from a few minutes ago. A biological weapon that's released that's so hideous you can't comprehend it. Well, I've never said that it couldn't happen. I said it's giving the government a little too much uh, credit. So, um, in, in in the sense that you don't think that they're smart enough to 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 prepare that way. No, they're smart enough to prepare themselves that way, but they're not. I mean, the the milk, the government just cannot prepare the public for something like that. Mm-hmm. They can't. It's impossible. There are millions and billions of us. They can't. Right. So. Um, no, they would. Uh, they would say, "Hey, it's, they're zombies. They have to be eradicated." I mean. Pretty much. Like, they just have to take care of it once it happens and hope that we're prepared. But we're not We're not reliant on the government. We're not trying to be reliant right. on the government because the government isn't going to be here to help us, you know, immediately or if ever. So we're trying to be reliant on ourselves and trying to teach people how to be reliant for themselves and if, for their if, family and for their team. Morgan, if, if there really was a zombie apocalypse, whatever that is, if there really was one, what would have to be done with the zombies? Um, I mean, it would really depend on what. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like if you got like five of them on your porch, what do you do with them? Uh, headshots. That's all you got to do. Headshots. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so if if there really is a zombie apocalypse, anybody who is infected with whatever is being labeled as zombieism, they will have to be executed. You, you can't have any contact with they just have to be taken out. Unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um you know, is that that would be the hard truth of it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So do you think there's a possibility the the government is prepping the public for mass executions of people? 
I really, I couldn't answer that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I, I'm just speculating. This is so all of it's so bizarre to me that I'm, I'm like, hey, if the government is dressing up like zombies and that's bizarre, then, then my scenarios can be bizarre too, because they're bizarre. I mean, yeah, everybody has their own kind of. <laughs> everybody has their own theories. Yeah, once you go down this road of being bizarre, there's no limit to how bizarre you can think. You know, um, pretty much. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what are they up to? What are they preparing for? Well, my job is not to. I know. Uh, try I, to figure out like what what they're what they're trying to do. My job is trying to protect myself and my family right. and my team from whatever may happen. Okay, so, let's let's go back to this, Morgan. If there really is a zombie apocalypse, and you know, let's let's just assume that we're not talking about. The Walking Dead coming out of graves, but you know some type of hideous biological weapon or some disease that that has never been seen on the planet and it and and it just spreads and this is you know instant death if you come in contact with with an infected zombie, then how do you what are you telling people how are they how how will people protect themselves um we always tell people to stay indoors. Their home is their best defense against anything, any disaster. I mean, unless your home is being personally attacked and it's no longer safe for you to be there, then there's no reason for you to ever leave, to ever come in contact with a zombie, even if they're in at your door. If they aren't coming in, who cares? What, um, what if your uncle is a zombie? And my uncle's a zombie. I mean, what do you do if a relative is a zombie? Then so be it. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, they could go down for any number of one of the reasons, you know, not just being a zombie, you know, death precedes us every day. So it's mm-hmm. not, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's not, um, you know, it's just something we have to deal with the thing yeah. at a time. What, what kind of, what kind of preparation and training is the zombie response team doing for people to get ready for something like this? Um, we teach them how to be basically self-sufficient and, um, you know, and help teach them how to be um, prepared for disasters mostly. But, um, you know, it, it, as far as, like, you know, how to find water and purify it, how to, you know, find and hunt your own food, how to, you know, um, create a garden, a bug-out bag, you know, the... Uh, procedures of emergency disasters, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, it's a whole wide, wide variety of things that we teach people. Um, but, I mean, it's just all about being self-sufficient, you know, if the government or, you know, the government's not going to be there for you, to be quite honest. You know, if you look mm-hmm. at Katrina or any other disaster, I mean... They're just not there. You know, it takes them days and days to get prepared, and for good reason. It's a huge catastrophe, and they have to go up the chain to figure out how to actually execute a plan, um, even if they knew it was coming. So, Yeah, look look at what happened in Japan. The Japanese government told the people fleeing Fukushima to go into the radiation plume. Yeah. (laughs) So whatever the government tells you to do, do the opposite. I mean, at that point, I don't. We don't even listen to the government. I mean, if the government, if if I were trying to help in a disaster scenario, and the government came and said, "Okay, we got it from here," I'd be like, "Cool," and I'll go on my way to um, continue helping myself and my family or whatever. But you know, I'm not going to get in their way, but I'm also not going to rely on that. Mm-hmm. So, is the zombie response team? Is this, uh, you know? Basically, I mean, you're really focusing more on um, realistic uh, disasters, uh, natural disasters, earthquakes. Uh, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe you know, uh, uh, an attack on the power grid, a cyber attack, something like that. Is is the zombie attack, the apocalypse? Is that like just far out idea to just draw attention to to your organization? Well, it's a it's a far out idea, but it's one that you know it falls in the anything can happen scenario. Um, so, 
I mean, we like zombies and we like the zombie genre and we do bring in a lot of people, but we also, um, you know, detract a lot of people from it. A lot of people don't like, you know, the zombie aspect of it and they wish it were just, you know, the prepping aspect. So, um, you know, we walk a very thin line mm-hmm. of, you know, bringing the education to people mm-hmm. while being, you know, funny with the zombie genre and, um, how, how do you so, do your How you do you know, do your training and education? Do you have chapters, or is it every everything done online? How do you do this? Um, we we do we have branches, and um, we're always trying to expand that. But they um, they do their training. We actually train the branch leaders as as best as we can to help them not only create their branches, but to have the resources to be able to educate people and the people that we find. Four branches are already educated people. They're people that, you know, have basic knowledge of basic survival. So we're not having to do a whole lot to support them in the education aspect mm-hmm. that they can just kind of run with it. So, but we do online training and we do local training in San Antonio, and um, we're, you know, always thinking of new ideas on mm-hmm. how to get the information out to people. So, okay, Morgan, last question: What, um, you know? On realistically, what do you and the you know the key the core leaders of zombie response team? What, you know, what do you really expect is going to be um, the most likely disaster that you're going to have to be ready for? Um, I I think a realistic a realistic um, disaster that could actually happen in our lifetime would be either some sort of EMP or nuclear war or something along those lines. I mean, those things are always threatened, you know, almost on a daily, it seems. Mm -hmm. And those things are a very real threat to us. So um, it it will probably be one of of those things. Yeah. Do you know about China publishing a map uh, last week with uh, the the cities that they plan to nuke in the United States? Yeah. 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 Kind of brings it home, doesn't it? Yeah, it's all very, very real. Whether they do it or not, it's not my problem. I'm going to be prepared as best as I can for it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't really, you know, be prepared for, you know, all the way. But Crazy world we're living in, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it really is. Well, listen, Morgan. I appreciate you uh, taking time. You've been you've been a delightful guest, and I've I've enjoyed and I've uh, talking to you, and I've learned. I've learned a lot about zombies today that I didn't know, so I, I appreciate it. And anybody wants to visit the website, it is zombieresponseteam.net, zombieresponseteam.net. My guest, Morgan Barnhart. Thank you, Morgan. Yes, thank you so much. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, this is True News. Do you look at yesterday's mistakes and think failure? God looks at your potential today and says something quite different. With Encouragement for Believers, here's today's Moment with Charles Stanley. Now I want you to remember this because oftentimes we excuse ourselves. Remember that Moses was a murderer. He killed an Egyptian soldier. He killed him on purpose. He was a murderer. But God used him to lead the Hebrew children out of Egyptian bondage and became the statesman of the Old Testament. Look at the Apostle Paul. He did something worse than that. He not only was guilty of murder, he was his idea to eliminate the name of Jesus on the face of the earth and to eradicate the Christian church. And he became God's most awesome missionary. Do you think that he would ever have thought that God could possibly have used him like that? What do you think he thought sitting in a cell in Rome that he would have the potential by the power of God, to write an epistle, and more than one epistle, a number of epistles, that would absolutely revolutionize the life of people 2,000 years later. You see, you do not know what your potential is. Don't look back at your past and say, well, back yonder made this mistake, so did they. Well, back yonder I did this, so did they. The issue is, are you willing to line up today with the will of God in your life and discover what He can do what he will do. 
You say, well, I don't know that God loves me all that much. Yes, he does. That is your thinking. You can never prove that with the word of God. What you have to ask is, what does the word of God say? And the word of God says very clearly that from God's perspective, what has he done? He has made you wonderfully and skillfully. That is, he hasn't left anything out. It's all there. This is segment three of True News, and I'm Rick Walls. The 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy is just days away, a half century after the murder of one of America's most beloved presidents. Most Americans do not believe the official government storyline about the assassination. Researchers continue to uncover shocking details that the government and the mainstream news media refuse to discuss. Veteran investigative journalist Anthony Summers is on the telephone from Ireland. He is the author of the 1998 classic book about the JFK shooting. The book is Not In Your Lifetime. He recently updated the book with stunning new information, which uh, he is the first person to reveal. His website is anthonysummers.com. Mr. Summers, welcome to True News. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be speaking with you. I do just want to say... I I really try. You know, my background is the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and I try to write very balanced material. And you are right that there are some um, dramatic developments in, in the update of my book, Not In Your Lifetime. On the other hand, I'm loath to, to suggest that we that I write sensationally. There's been so much nonsense written about this case over the years. That's true. And uh, uh, obviously what, what you have in this book is not sensationalism. Uh, it, it is uh, – you have uh, detailed facts, and and the American people need to hear it. Um, so, uh, well, I, I think so, without being patronizing. I do think so, and you touched on something as you were introducing the interview just now, um, which is that you said the mainstream um, American media – somehow doesn't quite do do it, doesn't quite get there. And it's true that in recent years it's been sort of infotainment, and it, and it rather, in a repellent kind of way, particularly at the moment, the main networks on the whole haven't been, don't really take invest, investigative journalism seriously. They just, they like the roll on the drums and so on. But the reason I did the book in the first place way back when I made a, a documentary for the BBC, was that I was appalled to discover, that when I went to, to do interviews, um, that if the people I went to see didn't throw me down the stairs, then, then they would very often say, I would be apologizing and say, saying, um, you know, I'm sorry, I must have been here on the heels of the New York Times and the Washington Post and NBC and so on. And they would, in many cases, say, no, come in. Uh, we have never uh, talked to the media before. And what's really striking is that the media back in 1964, after the assassination, simply trusted the Warren Commission to do its work. And, and no contemporary Woodward and Bernsteins, as it were, were put on the story and told, you're on this story until I say you're off it, even if it takes two years. It didn't happen. And the reason that I did the documentary, in a way, and that certainly that I wrote the book afterwards, was that I felt a sort of um, duty, almost, if that doesn't sound quixotic, a, a duty to to repair the omission of of the mainstream media. Mr. Summers, um your, your your book was first published in 1998. Uh, here we are, uh, 2013. We're just days away from the 50th anniversary of the of of the death of Mr. Kennedy. Um, what what inspired you? What prompted you to update the book? There were several things, but particularly in 2007. Um, I had a, a break um, in Florida. I'll tell you how it happened, and I think it is significant. Um, 
I've stayed in touch over the years with the former chief counsel of the House Assassinations Committee, Robert Blakey, um, who's himself stayed in touch with, with the case. He's a distinguished man. Um, he introduced the RICO Act, which has had such a big effect on on stopping the organized crime, the U.S. Mafia in its tracks. And um, serious man. And he got in touch with me and said that he had had a contact. This is 2007. He'd had a contact from a Cuban exile in his 80s who had called him or got in touch and said um, that he wanted to get something off his chest before he died. And so we had a conference call with the, with the old man, and we decided that he sounded credible. And uh, we both flew to Florida and, and spent two days with him, and we interrogated him as toughly as you can interrogate a man in his 80s. And essentially, what he gave us was an interview that ident plausibly, I'm going to say this carefully, plausibly identified for the first time by name, uh, a man who may have fired in Dealey Plaza, a, a gunman who may have fired in Dallas who'd never been, been heard of before. Having done the interview, I then went down the track and did, of course, a massive research into the background of this man, who, who has long been dead. He was, he was an anti-Castro exile who was killed in a raid on Cuba in 1966, three years after the assassination. And what I found was that unlike others, one or two others, and only a few who've been named as possibly having been a gunman in Dallas, this man ticked all the boxes. He, he was um, an anti-Castro exile, uh, and the, the more extreme anti-Castro exiles loathed President Kennedy because they saw him as having betrayed their cause. Um, he um, was a known political assassin. He had, um, he, he, uh, had killed so, uh, former chiefs of police in Cuba, of Cuba and so on, and tried to kill Figueres, the president of Costa Rica, and tried to kill, before Castro, tried to kill the president of Cuba, Batista. He was a marksman, a crack shot. And also, he'd worked for Santo Traficante, the mafia boss um, in Florida, who is one of the chief suspects of the House Assassinations Committee. Um, and, and he was in the United States in 1963. So he was a most unusual person in the sense that he ticked all the boxes and said before he was killed in battle that he had participated, this is his word, participated in, in the assassination. Who did he make the confession to? He made it to uh, Tony Cuesta. Um, Cuesta was uh, a celebrated hero of the anti-Castro movement. Um, and it was, according to Cuesta... Uh, it was on the way into the battle in which the alleged um, assassin, uh, Herminio Diaz, was killed, that he, he said he confessado, he confessed or admitted to having been involved um, in the assassination, not bragged, but just confessed. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, the circumstances in which Cuesta said this are themselves notable, he was terribly wounded himself in that attack on Cuba. He lost an arm. Uh, he was blinded. His hearing was shot. And uh, he was being looked after by um, the man we interviewed, Martinez, who um, they discovered that both of them knew the alleged assassin, Hermino Diaz. But Cuesta didn't come out with any detail and, and I find that credible because he was so terribly wounded at the time. I mean, there was a real question as to whether he'd survive his wounds. Um, in short, all of the circumstances made the allegation plausible. I won't say more than that. I've, I've tried to be careful in my book on, on all matters to be balanced and not to jump to conclusions. Um, but um, it was a plausible identification of an unknown gunman. Uh, Mr. Summers, regarding the, the elderly Florida man, wh why did he feel burdened to get this confession off his chest? 
Well, he didn't stand anything to gain mm-hmm. um, by by talking to me and Professor Blakey. Um, he he so, said he'd sort of carried it around. He said at one point when he got out of Cuba and came to the United States that he had gone to the FBI, who just hadn't seemed very interested. Um, that may seem strange, but um, I... That doesn't seem to, strange to me at all. I, I've, heard that, I've heard that line many times over 15 years yes. of this radio program. Yes, uh, and I, I think it is, it is plausible. I mean, man, man walks into bureau office years after the event, and they, they maybe thought that he was what in the early days in, in my career in the, in the newspaper business we used to call a front hole case, somebody who just walked in, and a young reporter is normally sent down to 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 see him and interview him and you know nine times out of ten the person turns out to have no story at all but what the young reporter hopes is that that the tenth one will have the big story and sometimes they do so but there was a there's a more insidious thing and it's interesting that you react the way you do um, to my referring to the FBI Uh, I did a book years earlier you know a biography of J. Edgar Hoover and uh, I remember then, although my interest was Hoover and the F- the old FBI, very different now, um, not not the Kennedy assassination, but nevertheless, I would find myself talking to old agents. And I remember one distinctly who said that he'd filed a report not uh, during the, the investigation after the assassination. He'd filed a report to Washington that had just an edge of something that suggested conspiracy perhaps in it and he the the physical report was flown back to him at his um office in california with instructions to rewrite it leaving out the questions leaving out anything that that remotely indicated conspiracy and the the whole impression that i got is that hoover and indeed lyndon johnson wanted to put the lid on the saucepan to for what whatever had happened had happened there was an alleged assassin the alleged assassin was dead and they didn't want it to be they didn't want the case to be developed wherever it was going to lead um i'm not the only author to think that um but that is my experience from studying the paperwork and and interviewing agents former agents on the ground uh, you, you mentioned uh, Mr. Johnson. Roger Stone was here last week or so, and uh, he he worked for Richard Nixon. And uh, he said that Richard Nixon personally told him that he knew, he recognized, he knew Jack Ruby. And uh, Mr. Stone linked Lyndon Johnson to a hitman who worked for a Mr. Bird who owned the the book uh, depository building, and who was also Lyndon Johnson's Senate campaign fundraising chairman. Mm. I don't buy it. Um, I, I know about um, Stone's work, and, and I certainly know about Nixon, because although I was in this conversation I sound as though I've done them all, I did a big biography of Richard Nixon years ago. It is no secret that he would say, ah, well, you... You, on, you lift one of those rocks and you find out about Dallas. Words to that effect. Um, and But most pertinently, what I don't think there is a shred of evidence for is that LBJ, in fact, had anything. There is no evidence for it. One can see that there would be a motive. He wanted to become president. He was being marginalized, perhaps, as vice president. But before one makes... And one can make emotional judgments like that but then you have to have some some evidence to back it up and i i i read an account of 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 stone's recent statements um just the other day and i i fear i didn't buy any of it Mm -hmm. Uh, who who was uh mr diaz working for oh diaz worked um after the castro revolution he was working in one of the big casinos casino hotels in Havana and and the person who ran the casino and owned it was Santo Traficante who was the um, 
the big mafia boss in, in Florida uh, and who was one of the prime suspects of the House Assassinations Committee. Um, the mob, of course, was on the run during the Kennedy administration as never before. And the mafia certainly had reason um, to want to get rid of President Kennedy. And at all sorts of levels, key mafia bosses expressed hatred for President Kennedy. But the interesting thing is that the mafiosi were also interested in getting getting rid of Castro, because under Castro they had lost an empire, gambling and hotel empire, that was in those days more valuable to them than Las Vegas. And, and it was gone at a stroke under Castro, so they... They, and they wanted it back. And I, I, what I've developed, and I try to speculate in the book as little as possible, but what I've developed, and this is a speculation, is, is that um, if the anti-Castro people and the senior mafiosi, um, not all, but just one or two of them, plotted to kill President Kennedy for their own good reason from their point of view, then the, the master stroke would have been to have it uh, blamed on, on Fidel Castro. And indeed, that's, that's pretty much what happened. If you study the hours and days right after the assassination, there's an obviously already prepared pattern of, of um, propaganda being blared out from all sorts of directions, suggesting that that Castro was some, somehow involved. And when you take it all apart and analyze the allegations that were made, it turns out that, that there actually isn't any, any evidence now, certainly, that Castro was involved. And if you think about it, it would have been pretty lunatic for, for, for Castro, although he, you know, is a, a mercurial, Matt was, and, and, and still is to the extent he's still alive, of course, um, a mercurial personality. But nevertheless, if it had been discovered um, that Fidel Castro had a hand in the assassination of President Kennedy, he could have been absolutely sure that the United States um, would have invaded and, and swept away his revolution um, in short order. And that alone would have been a reason for not getting involved in, in the assassination. Was the assassination the product of of multiple Kennedy enemies coming together for one for one common purpose? You know, I'm going to say I don't know, because I think any reporter or historian who says firmly that they know what happened in Dallas um, is talking through their backside. The whole point is that because of so many things having been botched at the beginning and indeed later, that we don't know. We don't know the answers, and we may never know the answers. Um, but it does seem from from the documents and from the interviews I've done, I did conduct many interviews myself with people, many of whom have now have since died. And putting it all together, you have a picture, a, a jigsaw, of which some parts are still missing. But the persuasive information you get from, from that picture is is that the anti-Castro people and organized crime people um, may well have put the assassination together. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the, uh, you know, the, the the debate about how many shots were fired, uh, do you have any any new information? I, I, I don't think one should pretend to. It's too long ago. The autopsy was desperately badly botched um, and should have been performed in Dallas where they have a little bit of experience of um, gunshot wounds um, and and wasn't the the corpse of the, the cadaver of the president was taken away at gunpoint from the Dallas authorities and whisked off to Washington um, and all sorts of things as you probably know went wrong at the time of the autopsy um, and the evidence from Dallas itself is a muzzle. Um, it is difficult to... to, to it, it is impossible to say anything certain about whether there were just um, 
shots coming from behind or also a shot coming from the infamous grassy knoll in front. But the impression, the sort of educated impression is that there was, and this is what the House Assassinations Committee thought, that there was also someone um, firing from from in front of the the president. And you know, the the Warren Commission conceded that the only way that they could account for the shots um, and put them all down to Lee Harvey Oswald was um, t- the, the famous single bullet theory that supposedly went through the president and then into Governor Colony, who was sit- sitting in the in the front of the limousine. And uh, you ask if there's anything new on that. Um, all that I can m- mention is that the Livermore uh, National Laboratory, um, acting under the auspices of the Department of Energy, just two or three years ago, um, in, in just before the turn of the decade, um, came up with information suggesting that in their view, uh, the single bullet theory didn't hold up. Uh, and that, that that's interesting. Are there still Kennedy documents that are sealed? Oh, yes. Um, and most significantly, there are 1,171 CIA documents that are being withheld that could be many more pages than 1,171. But those those documents are being withheld uh, under a national security classification. What could be be the national security classification, the justification for it 50 years later? You took the words out of my mouth. (laughs) Um, All this time later, if the scenario was really as simple as, as Oswald doing it um, on his own with no complications as, you know, he's variously referred to as the lone nut or the, the lone gunman and so on, then why in the world, 50 years on, would anything have to be national security classified? Um, it, it's a question, and clearly they should should release those documents. By law, those documents and the others that are still withheld by um, federal agencies um, and there are some. I mean, there were many, many, many documents have been released um, under the law passed during the Clinton presidency. But those documents remain withheld and by law have to be released in the year 2017 um, unless the president of the day um, orders that they still be withheld. Mr. Summers, I appreciate you taking time to be with us today. My guest, Anthony Summers. Uh, The book, Not In Your Lifetime, originally released 1998. It has been updated as we come close to the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination, Not In Your Lifetime. Mr. Summers' website is anthonysummers.com. Sir, thank you. Appreciate you being on True News. Thank you very much. As today's program comes to a close, I remind you that True News is a non-commercial, advertiser-free, independent newscast. Our entire budget is supported 100% by the generous gifts of our radio audience around the world. We're midway in the month of November, and there are only six and a half weeks remaining in the year. If you've been listening to True News throughout 2013 and haven't become a contributing member of our ministry, I sincerely encourage you to support True News before the year is over. The holiday period from Thanksgiving Day to New Year's Day can get very lean for a lot of ministries as people are busy with families and shopping and holiday events. But my faith is strong that True News will be blessed in the final weeks of the year because our audience is a different group of people than those attracted to other ministries. I very much appreciate you supporting us. You may donate online at truenews.com and PayPal users should enter support at truenews.com. God bless you. See you on the next edition.